Welcome to the Morelli End. Uh, my name is Mark Machado. I'm joined uh, by Dominic Machado, and I'm also joined by a very, very special guest. Um, we've got former Sri Lanka cricket analyst uh, Prad Navaratnam uh, joining us. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, before we do that, please, if you haven't done so already, hit the subscribe button, subscribe to our newsletter. It comes into your email every week. Uh, the links are all below in the description. And um, if you know any other Shrunken fans, let them know about this show and, and spread the word of the Murali End. Regular Shrunken cricket content in English all around the world. Uh, before we get into it, I should also let you know that Prad is in Sydney, I am in London, and Dom <laughs> is on the East Coast of America. So we're recording this, I think it's 10 o'clock in the morning in Sydney time, Prad, is that right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, yeah. It's 11 p.m. the night before in London, and it's 6 p.m. Uh, 6 p.m. in uh, on the East Coast. Prad, thanks for joining us today um, and telling us a little bit about your story and what is the role of analytics within the team. And hopefully, at the end of this, we'll get to words. Uh, you know what, what you think Sri Lanka's doing right, what you think they're doing wrong, and where they can improve. I suppose the first question to ask you, Prad, is how did you get into the world of sports analytics? Uh, great. Well, first of all, look, thanks, guys, uh, for your time. I know you're up pretty late, so <laughs> thanks for making it work as well. Um, but, yeah, look, great question. Um, so so sports analytics, uh, when I started, this is going back about oh, five, six years ago um, is when I first started getting into it. Um, you know, back then, it wasn't as advanced as, as it is now. So even if you think five, six years ago, the likes of, you know, CrickViz, um, they were around, uh, and Nathan Lehman was, was around doing what he's doing. But... Um, it wasn't as big as what it is now. Um, and so back then when I first got into it, um, I, I've got a finance background. I've got, yes, a career background and all that, but I've, my, my predominantly my day to day was in, in finance. So I've, I've got a love for numbers, um, but I've got an equally as big love for cricket um, and sport. Um, and I thought, you know, one day I was just playing around. I thought, you know, why not see what I can do with both of them together? Um, and I started off actually surprisingly in rugby league, so which is the biggest sport, obviously, in on, you know our part of the world in, in, in UK and in Australia. Um, but what I what I found was in, in 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 rugby league, at least at the time, was you know numbers were very um, they weren't used in an analytical way. It was very much just the raw data, just you know exactly what you see. So in cricket terms, okay, how many runs were they scored? What's the average? Just the basic stuff, right? Um, so there, there wasn't any analysis done. Um, and I started playing with the numbers and coming up with things. Um, and I realized, okay, I've may, maybe got something here. And I started reaching out to a couple of the rugby league teams, got a gig um, in, I think, 2017 with one of the teams here in the NRL. Uh, did that for a year. Then I thought, okay, I'm going to now try cricket because uh, that's my first love. Um, and I reached out to Cricket New South Wales at the time because I was living in Sydney. Um, and, and worked with them for a season as well where I, I rebuilt the entire player profiles and how to look at it not just wow. from basic data, but yeah, from analyzing every player across every situation against different bowling types, the whole works. Um, did that for a year. Um, and from that, I think I was lucky that I got a got a bit of um, take up. Uh, Hunter Singh at the time was a Sri Lankan head coach. He's ex Cricket New South Wales coach. He had heard of me. Um, and uh, so had uh, Jerome Jayaratna, who's, who was at the time the chief cricket officer as well. Um, so they both got in touch with me and said, oh, look, you know, we'd like to have a chat to you. And that's kind of how it got started. And off we went. That was the time Mickey had just joined, Mickey Arthur had just joined Sri Lanka Cricket as well. So, Wow. So that's a brilliant story. I love the the story of a, a finance background. And then you found your true love and your true calling. And you just did that that work and put your skills to good use. Uh, you know, any young listeners out there, if you're interested in getting involved, right, that passion, that ability to bring something new and different is is so interesting. So uh, I think the next question, you brought us up to your time with the, the Sri Lankan team. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like? What was your role yep. like? How were you used? What kind of um, capacity did you interface with the players? Yeah, great question. So initially when I was brought on board, uh, my role was um, head of uh, uh, performance analysis at the Sri Lankan Red Bulls. As we know, the SLC, they've got a brain center there, right? Um, up until the point I joined, the brain center's primary primary role was data collection. So when I'm saying data collection, you know, they, they're watching all the matches wherever it's played in the world, whatever teams played, and they just log all this data in and they just load it 
and then each that there's a team of about seven or eight guys there that then each guy's kind of allocated to whether it's the national team, the women's team, A team, so on and so forth. And then they use that data that they collect and they just provide the coaches with that. Um, but the feedback that the cricket board was getting was that they weren't getting the right information. They weren't getting actionable information. They were just getting, like we said, very basic data, right? Um, they weren't getting any information that they could actually act on. Um, so I was brought on and said, you know, I was given quite clear instructions and told, you know, look, we, we need to rebuild this. So do whatever you need to do. Just we need this to work kind of thing. So when I first joined, I wasn't actually with the team. My role wasn't to be traveling with the team. It wasn't to be with the team at all. It was purely based at SLC, at the head office, and to rebuild it. Um, so I went in there and, and really I kind of threw a grenade in and blew it all up and rebuilt it. Um, we, we decided to source, the, stop doing data collection completely. Um, we then switched to sourcing the data from a third party provider out of India, which has made just complete sense. Um, and I started training these guys in the brain center on how to analyze, how to use this data, how to put together things that the coaches would need. Um, and that's where my first job was. Um, part of that role was as well was I had a broader goal, uh, a major goal of actually building a really large database where we can analyze um, players all the way from school cricket from under 13 all the way through. Um, I couldn't end up doing it, unfortunately, for various different reasons. Um, but I, I went as far as we... So if you go into the Sri Lanka Cricket website at the moment, there is a new, um, you know, if every match that's played is a match centre. So that was part of my project. So that's what I introduced there as well, because that same match centre now goes all the way down to domestic. Um, and that's as far as it goes. But that same match centre is what I wanted to drive all the way down to school cricket. And then you just have the same player profile, right? You, you pick a player like a, like a Will Allegay, right? From the time he starts playing under 13 um, at, at St. Joseph's, he has the same record on Sri Lanka cricket system all the way through from under 13 to 15 to 17 to 19 to 18. So when from Sri Lanka cricket's perspective, we can see, right, how is he played against leg spin? And when he was 13 versus when he was 15 versus, you know, how is he developing? How is he, you know what I mean? So you can really get that data. We couldn't quite get there at the end of the day. Um, but I think Sri Lanka Cricket still can do it. They've got the foundation for it. So that's where my role initially was. Um, Brad, can I, they, can I just, can yeah, I just sure. ask, where, where did the inspiration for that for that idea come from? Did, was that just something you'd, you'd thought of or had you seen that implemented elsewhere? No, look, I, I knew it was implemented at Cricket Australia. Um, but I knew how much of a value, and I still believe how much of a value can add to Sri Lanka cricket because school cricket is massive in, in Sri Lanka, right? So the, the value for, and, and there's a lot of times the players go straight from school to the national setup. Whereas in Australia, they've got the system, but they don't, you, like you don't have many school players go from school to the national setup in Australia. So it was, for me, I was like, I'd seen it in Australia and I said, oh, wow, this could really work in Sri Lanka uh, because I understood the Sri Lankan system, but that's where the inspiration kind of came about. And, so, and, um, yeah, go. Oh, I was going to say, uh, what was, you know, you said it was, you weren't able to see it through. What were the main reasons why inhibiting you from kind of finishing the um, project? Look, it, it's a, it's a, it was an extremely large project, to be honest. Um, um, you know, it, it took us a while to get going just from, because you're working with an external party as well. The, the external third party is one that provided the database and the systems behind it, right? I didn't want Sri Lanka Korea to go into building it. We could, Go talk about saving costs and all, but I felt we were being penny wise, pound foolish by trying to save costs here and then constantly have to fix it down the track. Whereas you just get a third party provider, you just say, hey, this is what we need. Can you provide it? Get it done. And we can focus on the cricket. Um, so it was it was a large project to manage. There's a few things that happened. So part of it was actually the next part. Sorry, was, was um, this is around the time COVID hit. Um, and I think it was after that infamous UK tour. Um, oh, Durham, everything changes Durham. in Durham. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So straight after that, uh, uh, the team had just gone back and we were going straight into uh, uh, to India. It was coming to Sri Lanka. And so, you know, back then you were going from uh, bubble to bubble. So you, you were going two weeks before the series started, right? So um, the analyst who has been with the team since, I don't know, 2012, 2014, he was still with the team. Um, he came down with COVID and... Um, Jerome Jaran, the chief crew officer, just, I remember calling me going, be prepared, just get your bags packed. I'll let you know in the next couple of hours, but you might need to check into the hotel tomorrow. And I've gone, okay, no worries. I've packed my bags <laughs> and they've gone, yep, go check in. 
<laughs> and I've just, and mind you, I've never met the players. I met, I'd met Mickey. Um, and I'd spoken to Mickey and I'd done some work with Mickey before, but you don't know about the players. Anyways, so I went in um, and I was fortunate because that was Dustin's first series as captain um, and Mickey had already met. Um, and they were both very open to how I was approaching the game. Right. You got to remember, I've I've lived and grown up in Australia since I was 15. So I brought a very much an Australian background. I wasn't the quiet, oh, you tell me what to do. I was kind of being the Australian, you know, forward saying, hey, can we do this? Let's do that. Can we change this? Um, and I was fortunate because Mickey and Dustin were great. They were both open to it. They said, yep, you know, put it all together, see what we can do. So we had the India series. India series finished. And then fortunately, unfortunately for that project, um, Dustin, I was supposed to go back to my old role, but Dustin made the request saying he wanted me back with the team. So I then joined them back again for the South Africa series, following which from that we went to the World Cup. And, you know, one thing led to another, and then I was caught up with that. I couldn't quite implement the full project. Oh, I, so, I, I, yeah. I don't know if that's one of the great losses of Sri Lankan cricket, like whether because they would have had that <laughs> that piece of infrastructure. If you were able to see it through, that in theory could have lasted, you know, an, another yeah. decade or so. I'm sure, though, I'm sure someone's yeah. listening to this at SLC, they might be able to pick it up and kind of see through your your yeah your vision. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, so it would be great if they do. And I, yeah. I was thinking, you know, that that series is also kind of indicative of why that project is so important because there were so yep. many new bloods in the national team. Right. You right. can't go to international cricket and say, okay, let's look at these databases and see what they did. You have to know what they've done before and yep. know what the strengths and weaknesses are. Right. So, yep. and I can imagine that, you know, the way Sri Lanka cricket operates, we're, we're always close to a crisis. So who knows when we'll be, <laughs> we'll be at a bubble point and, you know, we're, we're blooding new guys again, but, it speaks yep. to the power of your project because having that kind of data and knowing what players can do and being able to say, you know, hey, we're missing this in the team. This guy yes, who exactly. might not have considered, right, is a guy who can fill that role. No, exactly. That's exactly right. It was about building talent pools, right? And then this was helping us build those talent pools rather than working on noise or what I call noise in the sense of, you know, oh, yeah, this guy's pretty good. So, yeah. But from from looking at that raw data, because one of the criticisms that people have of Shrunken cricket is that apparently those t I say apparently because I d I don't know the data that there's too many first class teams in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. There's the kind of stats behind that kind of back it up and the, and the concept mm -hmm. that they're not because it's there's too many they're not playing top quality domestic cricket or as good as they could be playing. 100%, 100%. Um, I, I worked very closely with Tom Moody. So do you remember when he was appointed as director of cricket? Um, so he came on board and he worked, uh, I, I mean, I, not as, I mean, I worked closely with him hand in hand, but not for everything, but especially across, we were looking at, so, um, you know, performances on a domestic side. Um, we had to rebuild the contract system as well. Um, so I helped with that. Uh, and and I, I and, and and Tom and, and Mahela and Arvind at the time, they were all of the belief that, you know, that, the, the domestic system was too too big and, and I couldn't agree more. It, it, it's it's simply put just supply and demand, right? There's way too much supply there um, for us to get the high quality that we need, just very simply put. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, that, that the first class system needs to be short. And, and a great example, what I believe is Sri Lanka's got the same population as Australia, right? Roughly the same, about 20, 25 million. But Australia's got, I think, eight domestic teams, right? And I think they've got about something like eight or nine or maybe eight uh, big, big bash teams, right? So whereas you look at Sri Lanka and we've got 24 first-class teams with the same population, it doesn't make sense. Now, I'm not saying we need to play like Australia. Australia is very different, but the laws of supply and demand are the same wherever in the world, Yeah. right? Yeah. So um, even if you look at India, who's got, a, who's got a billion population, they don't even have as many domestic teams. <laughs> so, right, right. So... Uh, Oh, go, go, ahead. go for it. No. Um, so tell us a little bit. So you so you get roped in to actually being with the team. Tell us what that yep. was like. Because I, I can imagine as a cricket fan to go from, you know, all right, well, I'm working on this data. I'm doing this data to, oh, I'm going to be the right hand man of, <laughs> you know, the coach, the captain. I'm going to be providing them data. That's every yep. cricket nerd's dream right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, look, it, it is. And, and to, I, I, you know, something I missed was when I was growing up, I, my dream, you know, like you got you asked a little kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? I wanted to play cricket for Sri Lanka. So for me, yeah. it was like a dream come true. I remember, you know, um, the day I got my first training kit for that Indian tour, uh, yeah. the first thing I did, did was I took, I was like a kid at Christmas. I just took it out, <laughs> laid it all on the bed. I took a, I think I still have a picture that I took the picture of it. <laughs> I shared it with my family because for me, it was like, I made it, you know? <laughs> so it was, it was a, it was a genuine uh, dream come true moment. So I, I mean, I'm very grateful to Sri Lanka cricket and everyone involved for that. But um, so yes, yeah, so you, you went in that, you know, the one thing you had, I had to learn because I'd never been with a professional cricket team from this aspect before. Mm-hmm. Right. But one of the, critical roles or critical skills you need in this role is um, communication and learning to read people um, because not everyone's for data. So, but yet you might have this little piece of gold nugget that you need to get across to them. You just got to be really careful on how you get that across to them. Cause if you just go to them and say, Hey, here's a piece of information that I think can help. They might go, nah, you know, right. whereas you were that differently saying, Oh, you know, whoever, Virat Kohli is weak against this and when you bowl leg spin around the week or whatever, you know, you come up with whatever the plan is. Suddenly they're thinking, they're going, oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So um, so that's a very key skill. And, and I didn't know that at the time, but I had to learn it slowly. And that India series, um, for example, I was a big believer in matchups. Mind you, I'd, I'd done a lot of following and reading and research of Nathan at the time. This is before he wrote his books and stuff. Um, and and I, I saw what he was doing with matchups, and I was like, whoa, this is awesome. And I started trying to do it for us. And um, when it comes to matchups, the first thing you do is you build player profiles. You need the player profiles, right, across different situations and all that. And then from that, you analyze it and you get the matchups. And so we, I'd done these matchups in the India series, and I've gone to Dustin and I said, hey, hey, you know, do you know this is this can be done? And he was like, oh, yeah, we'll see. You know, he wasn't sold. So I said, oh, I just left it and I, I stepped back and then the series is going. And I think um, we were batting one of the games and I can't, I can't remember exactly, but the, the Indian, because uh, they, they hadn't said the strongest team at the time, but who I, can't, I think Shikha Dawan was a captain at the time. Yeah. He kept changing the bowlers. They He would have one bowler bowl this over, they'd get a wicket and then he'll straight away change the bowler to someone else. So I went next to Dawson, I sat down with him and I said, I said, do you know what they're doing here? And he goes, what? And I go, they're doing matchups. And he goes, what do you mean? And he goes, why do you think, the, you know, so-and-so Chahal just bowled and taken a wicket is not bowled again? And he goes, oh, and I go, it's because of this, right? We got to like, I think the third T20 or the third, yeah, the third T20 or third ODI, one of those, the T20 first, I think the third T20. And he goes to me at the start of the 20, he goes, all right, if you see anything, just before I go out of field, run out and let me know. And I said, all right. So um, I think it was, Prithvi Shaw was opening the batting and I ran, we had just batted first. I think we were about to go into ball and I ran down to him and I said, bowl Hasaranga to Prithvi Shaw early, right? I could just try it out. I didn't want to give him too much. I said, just try it out. I go, there's a matchup there. He goes, okay, okay, cool. I think, and I think on the third over or the second over, he brought Hasaranga on and he got him out. Um, and and I think, and then there was another one I said, I said it was, I think Shikha Dawan was Chimera and off, um, out fourth, off fourth stump line you're going away across with that angle um it tends to always edge it and we got him out as well and then wow. that was how dustin started to slowly believe a little bit and then he said oh, okay i can see this and so with that then went to the one day series and you know and it was the same with mickey as well mickey wasn't a f- like he was he, he sold on on data and, and and how it works but he also believes the captain needs to decide what he needs to do which is fair as well um so it was a matter of giving uh, mickey as well the information, my job was just to give them the information, whether they implement or not was up to the captain and the coach. So that's what I would do. I would always make sure my voice is heard though. That's incredible. Oh, that... How how long would it take you? Because from, from what you've told us, you had about two hours notice before you were in the camp. <laughs> yes. The, the <laughs> yeah. series. So, so what, were you just up all night make, drawing up these matchups, yeah. trying to drill the data? Man, I'll tell you what, back then, I wasn't doing as much, as much work for the matchups, right? So back then, um, fortunately, what we had done was, even though I wasn't with the team, part of my rebuilding of uh, performance analysis around cricket was I said, I want the 
analyst who's going with the team to go with these profiles. You have to take these profiles. Whether you use it or not, that's something I need to address later, but you need to start getting used to seeing what this is, right? So we had already done the profiles. So as soon as I would go onto the team, I just contacted the, the guys back at the brain center. I go, send me the profiles. I'm going to the t- with the team now. They sent it me, but I did spend, you know, that first couple of nights and I was trying to prove myself, right? I just, I remember the first night I was in the room. So I think for the first two days, you can't leave the room with your COVID, right? All I did was I sat in the room, I was going through the data, I was writing these notes. And I think, you know what? I think I still might even have some notes from that series. Um, <laughs> if from, from actually, um, let me see if I got it actually. It'd be quite, quite funny if I did. Oh um, man, they need yes, to be in the museum. If you've got them, they, they need to go in the Shrunken Cricket Museum. Wow. <laughs> I've got it here. See so if you can see that. It's a cinnamon grand. Uh, oh yeah, uh, I, see, I, see, I see that. All percentage there, run rate, all that. You know Exactly. I was, I was spending, amazing. and this is one of the notes, I was just looking at, you know, um, this goes into India and the subcontinent, you know, what was the dot percentage by over phases when they bat first overall, their run rates, their wickets. I was just trying to see if there's any trend in general with the team. Do they attack later? Do they attack earlier? What are they doing the, in the power play? Um, so I was just, because I was about to meet Mickey two days later. So I was trying to get all this information together so that when I met him, I could, you know, show, hey, this is what I think we should do. So that first tour, it wasn't too bad. Um, but, you know, answering your question, Mark, you know, going into a multi-team tournament like the World Cup or something is, is you know, it, the amount of work that goes in is, is ridiculous. Let me put it this way. For just a normal um, normal regular series where it's, you know, just two teams, we would work. So there's at the moment we changed the model at the Brain Center where it was me and I had two other supporting analysts supporting me. Um, and we would work, start work for a series at least two months. Basically, as soon as we know the squad, as soon as we know the opposition squad, we start work. So it takes about two months worth of work of gathering all the videos, all the data, putting it together. That then comes to me. I then spend a good at least six to eight hours minimum per team analyzing their batters and their bowlers to narrow it all down to one single presentation that we then present to the players which goes on for another hour or two hours, right? Now, you're doing that per team. So when you go to a multi-team tournament, um, I mean, and if you ever interview any of the coaches, you should just go, how did Pratt look at the end of the end of the tournament? <laughs> <laughs> I had comments saying, man, you look like you've never slept. And I go, I probably haven't. <laughs> because you're trying to do all that work and you've gone, you've got two days before matches. I mean, you're doing all the prep you can, right? But all it takes is you're playing six games. So there's only so much you can do before you got to get you got you got to leave and then all if we, when there's training on we got to attend training when the matches we've got to attend matches but when there's rest days we're working to doing all the prep so it it does take a fair bit of uh, fair bit of work to put the stuff together especially for the multi team tournaments and during a game what are you doing during the game are you kind of just that? Well, I, had, I I know you you're analyzing but what exactly are you yeah. looking at. Yeah, so 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 that was one thing I changed, right? So back when I joined, nearly every analyst except maybe the English and the Indian analyst um, was coding. So when we say coding, they're going every ball, they're recording the video, and they're plugging in, you know, this is the line, this is where the ball went, this is the shot, right? Um, I wanted to stop that because I said that's not, you know, getting any value from it. We can do that from anywhere in the world now. Um, so I changed it to analyzing in the sense that. Um, so another project of mine was I wanted to get to a stage where we could get into the dressing room live, not just live feed, but live data coming through, shooting through. So we're getting the Hawkeye data coming straight through. We're getting the co- the games coded in Sri Lanka and that coded data coming through. So the analyst who's with the team is then just looking at all these pieces of information and going, yep, this is what we're doing. This is what we're not doing and pass that information to the coach, right? Um, I got as far as... Um, getting the games coded in Sri Lanka and that data coming through, I couldn't get the Hawkeye data coming into our dressing room due to cost restrictions by SLC. They, they shut me down. Um, but I got as far as getting that set up and they're still doing it. Um, from what I last know is that they're, they're still still doing that. And then what the analyst, well, what I was doing was in a T20 game is you're basically looking at reams and reams of data constantly going, okay, you, you're trying to be an overhead. It's a game of chess. So you're trying to be one overhead. So the first step you've already planned before you've gone in of who the bowlers should be, what are our lines and lengths for the batters that we're expecting to be there, and what are our field settings. 
right? As the game goes, you're working out then, like say three, four balls in, you're already ready, ready getting the next over ready. You're right? Yeah. But if a wicket falls, you're going to go back and you're going to change it and reanalyze Gok and who's, and you, right. you've, got, you've got to be there because you've got to see who's padding up, who's going to walk in, not wait for them to actually walk in because you've got to be that early, right? And then you've got to quickly tell the coach by the fourth or fifth ball, hey, you know, I think off spin's a good option here. Mm. So that was my primary role, basically. That oh, feels almost more high pressure than being the captain. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It, it, well, it is. But once you, it's, it's a routine, right? Once you fall fall into that routine a little bit, it becomes a little easier. Um, and once again, we had Dustin who was who was open to us continuously feeding him that information. Different captains work differently. Some captains go, "Now nah, look, just send me whatever I need to know at the time. I don't want to constantly be told, you know, where's the where's the option." So it just depends. Um, Owen Morgan is another big fan of that, um, like Dustin, um, and I think. Joss Butler is not so much from what I've seen with English team. Um, so it just depends. Different captains, you know, want it differently. Fascinating. So, Brad, you've talked a lot about opposition scouting. Yes. Um, what about the self-scouting element? Uh, yeah. You know, is there ever information that you will provide to um, a batter between breaks if they're missing yeah. something or you know, I because I think that's one of the trickiest bits um, because I feel like giving information about the other team, okay, Virat Kohli, if you bowl fifth stump, he might chase it early in, in his innings, but after that, not going to happen. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. easy to receive that information. But yeah. if you say, hey, Machan, you know, oh, <laughs> you, know, you know, worth anything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? You've been trying to hit offside to leg spin and that clearly isn't working for you. How do you do that self scouting? And then you kind of talked about communication. How do you kind of go about that communication when you're talking about a player's game? I'd imagine bowlers are probably slightly easier to deal with than batters, right? You can say, yeah. change up your line. That's a normal part of things. But when a batter gets right. set, thinks this is my method. How do you, yeah. how do you do that? Yeah, great question. So you, you kind of answered the question there where you said communication is key. Um, so with the batters, we wouldn't do during the game, really. And I, that, I think that would be one of the worst things you could do. And any coach or captain would probably tell you that as well. They don't want their batters distracted. Um, so you just let them go out there and play. You give them a game plan beforehand. So we would kind of – see, the thing – the trick is um, – so there's two paths to it, right, with our batters. And, and we did this really, really well at the Asia Cup in 2022 when we won it, right? And I, I felt we were nailing it um, in that series where – what we would do is we'd talk about the opposition bowlers, right? we talk about, we'd analyze them so far that we'd try and predict what the bowlers would bowl, when they would bowl and what lines and lengths and where, what sort of deliveries and speeds and all that they would bowl, right? Then we would tell the batters, um, this is your targets, right? So we'd say, okay, you know, during the first six overs, this is roughly what we're trying to get to. So then each batter knows what their role is. Um, and then, you know, you would tell someone like Pat Demoki, your job is to bat through, um, you know, someone like, so someone like Dustin, for example, back then that Asia Cup, uh, a big thing we told him was, we said was, see after 10 balls, you become, you, you, you're literally chalk and cheese, pre 10 balls, post 10 balls. Right. 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 And, and I remember one game, Navid Navaz was sitting behind me. I can't remember which game it was. I'm in the India game. And, um, and I was, I was sitting here, Chris was here, Navid was behind me. And we were watching the ball count, watching the ball count. And then I didn't realize I was busy talking to Chris about something. Ball 11 comes. And, and, and that's in the first 10 balls he'd been, you know, just tapping, playing, missing, single here, single there. Ball 11 comes. He goes, bang, six into the stands. Now he taps me on the shoulder goes, ball 11. And I'm gone. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just, it's just this weird thing, right? So we would do it all pre-game and we would just give them that instruction um, because during the game, you probably don't want to upset their their thinking and their rhythm. Um, so it's all pre-game. So we do the opposition bowling scouting, and we'd also tell them stuff like, okay, get to ball 11, or your job is to bat through here, right? There were sometimes you would do something. So I remember the Australia series, um, uh, Patham sat down with me, and he wanted to look at his own game a little bit. Um, and, you know, we noticed he was scoring square of the wicket a lot, mm. and he wasn't unlocking the straight zones. So, and I told them, I said, if I was the opposition analyst and I'm looking at that, I'm telling, you know, Pat Cummins and Hazelwood, mate, bowl at the stumps at a fuller length, get him to play straight. He's, he clearly can't, right? 
Um, and then I kind of gave him that and he's like, oh, okay, yeah, it's a good, good piece of information. And, and I, I look, I don't know whether it worked or not, but you know, it's those pieces of information that you just kind of give them saying, this is, this is what I can see. You know, the, the, that you bring up the, the 22 Asia cup, I yeah. did feel like you, you could sense that there was a plan. I remember watching Crystal Mendes opening the batting. Yeah. It was very clear he had certain bowlers that you had that uh, I mean that he had been told you can be aggressive against them right particularly yep. pin bowlers inside the power play it seems yep. like there was that that sort of um, you know mode of of talking to the players and saying this is your game plan I, and I thought they are more than sort of um, more recently we've seen that game planning play out. Um, you know, whether it's Dawson taking 10 balls to get in, or I'd imagine someone like Bonica, you tell, okay, you can go from ball one because that's, yeah. that's your thing, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And, and, and that's right. And it, and it was a matter of, it wasn't so much so that we were picking bowlers to target. Um, you know, it, it wasn't that it was, it was just a matter of, I think everyone knew their role quite clearly. Um, you know, and, and that's so, 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 so Kusal Mendes, for example, knew he could go because Patham's role was to hold up the end, you know, so yeah. he knew what he had to do. So it didn't matter. Um, I mean, since then, you, you, depending on how, you know, how well it succeeds, right? So a great example, that first game in that 22 Asia Cup was against Afghanistan. We were rolled out for 108. Um, and I remember, right, so we've, we've games over we, in the dressing room in Dubai, um, and Chris, you know, he's an amazing coach. And he, he just he just sat down with the boys and he goes, okay, what's, you guys tell me, you know, what do we do here? What do we want to, how do we want to fix this? And, and Barnaker spoke up and he's like, coach, you know what? I think we just need to back ourselves here. You know, yeah, there's going to be days we're going to get rolled, but we need to back ourselves because there's going to be days when we come out and pump 200, right? right. Um, and Chris goes, yeah, let's do it. That's all we said. And then we just went boom, boom, boom. We just started winning every game from there. You know, you, we weren't, we didn't, we weren't in a situation where we're panicking and going, oh shit, you know, we've been rolled for 100. We're about to lose. We're going to get knocked out. I mean, there might have been a sense of panic if we lost that Bangladesh game and we were knocked out. And I know we took it quite close. Um, but credit to where credit's due, right? These guys, even though they conceded 180, they didn't give up. They backed them. They, they, they considered 180. They knew they'd been rolled for 108 the game before, but they just went out there and they said, nah, we're just going to play our game here. Um, and they they went, you know, punch for punch. So um, so that would that, and it came down to, and, and I spoke about this in a recent tweet where we we were able to do that because we had a batting lineup built for it, where we just had a couple of guys to bat through that everyone else's role was just just go, um, and that's what England did really well, you know, during their their heydays as well in 2019, 2020, 2021. They believed in it as well. You know, um, there's a famous line that Nathan says that I'm a strong believer in is, is wickets are overrated. You know, would you rather be 150 for two at the end of 20 or 190 all out? You know, I'd take the 190 all out any day of the week. Um, so so that's what that was the mentality we had in the Asia Cup. And that we, we ended up chasing 170, 180, 180 scores on. Yeah, it was flat tracks, but we've seen lately we've had flat tracks, but we're not getting anywhere close to that. So. Uh, that. There's a, there, there's so it's so fascinating to listen to you talk uh, talk. My first question as a fan though is, yeah. and you 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 know you, you talked about being a fan of shrunken cricket. Just what was it yeah. like being in the dressing room, <laughs> just all, all the time, like not you know yeah, not yeah, just yeah. getting get, get brought, brought in by an uncle, but actually being part of it and being. <laughs> and what's it like being mates with them as well? Like, I yeah, you're mates, I don't oh, know. that's a great question. I want to hear this. Yeah. <laughs> no, look, it, it, it's amazing, right? It's it's. Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, it's you know, I, I do miss it. I'll be honest. I do, I, I do miss you know that 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 camaraderie a little bit. Um, but you see their their human side of things as well. Um, and you know, and and when you've been with them and you've got to know them and you see then you know what gets said on social media and in the media and it, it, you know it's um, it, it's a bit harsh at times. I'll be honest because these guys at the end of the day are humans, um, and and you know the other side as well. Um, and I get it, you know, they're, they're creators and they're paid well to do their job. But I can tell you now, you know, no one and take it from me as a fan was in there. Um, you know, none of them, as far as I knew, you know, no one goes out there to to lose, you know, yeah. whoever it is, whoever the players are. Um, everyone, you know, no one goes out there to have a bad day, you know. And so they feel it like I've I've been in dressing rooms where these guys come back and, and you know, they're, they're really not happy with themselves. Um, so so they, they feel it definitely. 
Um, and it, it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience because you get to know these guys. It takes a while, you know, like everyone else, you know, you don't get to know them straight away. But I was fortunate in a way that I, was, I joined the team during COVID. So I was with the team where none of us could go out. So we were all forced inside this hotel where we had to, had to kind of get to know each other a little bit. Um, so that was really good. Uh, and I ended up making, you know, some good friends out of it. Um, and, I, and I'm always grateful for that. Um, and you know, you Who, get to know who's them. your best friend in the Sri Lanka squad? <laughs> I, I'll be honest, man. I, I, I don't have a, a best friend. You know, I enjoyed working with them all, to be honest. Um, uh, socially, you know, outside of cricket, I did uh, hang out with people closer to my age because at that time, you know, we had a lot of young guys come through. Um, so I, I was hanging out a lot more with the older crowd. So that, that back then was your Barnakers, your Dassuns. Um, those guys were a bit older at the time. Oh, they, they were, you know, in their 30s and I'm in my 30s. So we had a lot more in common. Um, but, but it, it, you know, it didn't mean like I, I was a big, I'm a big fan of Patham. Um, you know, so I was always, I always loved working with Patham. Mahesh Dikshana was another guy who's really easy, really good to talk to. Um, you know, Wani, Mendes, they're all, you know, they're all of them. Every, Danish uh, Gunnithilka as well. You know, he's, he's a, he's a great guy. And once again, in the 30s, they're able to get to know him quite well. But like, they're all, they're all great guys. Um, it, it was, it was tough because, you had to, you had the coaches, you had the players, you had to, you know, you had different um, age groups. And for me, it was difficult because I was in my 30s. So I was right in the middle of the coaches who were older than me and the players that were younger than me. So you you, you kind of had to balance both sides a little bit. Um, and w one of the questions I've always wondering when I watch Sri Lanka players is how do the co the foreign coaches how how well do they communicate with our players and do do our players do they re like how much do they understand how much are they able to take in for what they're being told because yeah the interesting thing I think when you go to Sri Lanka is is that it feels like everyone can understand English but that's not always necessarily true right yeah 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 exactly um no I think. The foreign coaches do a pretty good job um, when it comes to the communication piece because you've always got your local assistant coaches there that usually jump in and, and, and translate for them. So whether it's in meetings, whether it's in the dressing room, um, you know, whether it's Chris or Mickey, you know, they'd say it in English first and they'll ask whether it's Navid or PL or someone else to translate it for them. So that, that happens. Um, where the trick I find for me, for someone who grew up in Sri Lanka and then spent other half of my life in Australia where so I kind of understood both cultures, where I found the fall down was happening, and I didn't want to say it because it's not my, not my, you know, I, I, I think it was not my space to say it really, um, was I think the foreign coaches didn't quite understand the Sri Lankan culture around. So, in, you know, in Sri Lanka, when you go to school in Sri Lanka, it's very much the you do as I tell you culture, right? From school days, from your teachers, to your parents, to everything, right? So these players come up in that environment that when they get to the national team, they're expecting the head coach to say, okay, you know, I want you to bat till over 15. Or I want you to bat through, do I want you to do that, right? Whereas the foreign coaches, they come with a Western mentality of, all right, you guys work it out. You know, we'll give you all the information you need, but you need to work out what your role is and what you need to deliver, right? Um, huh. And I felt that that's where the clash was happening. Interesting. So, yeah, that's that's what I felt um, from my observations from from where I was sitting. But, you know, that, that's fascinating, you know, because I, I uh, you know, obviously as a Sri Lankan, you know, that that do what you're told attitude. And I, I just wouldn't have processed it in that way that they yeah. might respond better to explicit instruction more than, OK, you need to figure this out. You need to, you know, have your Zen moment and, yeah. your, you know, all those things. They're like, OK, no, just tell me tell me what I need to do and I'll do that. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, that that is really interesting in terms of unlocking the cultural code there. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. It, it just comes to confidence, right? So these guys get the confidence. Like they feel as, okay, the coach has told me, all right, go play my shots. Um, my job is to hit hit the ball. Um, they just feel confident in it. Whereas when they're told, all right, we're going to get, we're looking to get 50 or 60 in this block of overs, you guys work out how to get it. They're just like, oh, okay. So they're kind of caught between do I hit? Do I hold my wicket? What do I do here? Right. So, so that's where it is, where, where I feel one of the things, you know, that wasn't quite working. Uh, Pr Prad, if, as yeah. you were, you know, with the team, did you feel that, that your role kind of grew, grew with it and they were more responsive to what you were telling them? Or do you 100%. think it's kind of hit, hit a ceiling to a degree? Or 
Um, no, it definitely grew. It definitely grew. So you know, if I kind of take it back to that India series versus where I finished up, it grew. Um, one of the big catalysts for it growing uh, was the introduction of Mahela into the team. Um, he he was very you know pro data, pro uh, analysis and matchups and all that. Uh, and Chris's introduction as well was massive. That was another big point where we, where we took another step up. So so it definitely did grow. Um, where I felt you know, we hit a ceiling was, um, I think, you know, how much we were allowed to do within our roles, you know. Um, I, and, and a great example was 2022 Australia Series and Asia Cup. We were kind of just given a job saying, all right, this is what you need to do. Go and do it. And we were given the freedom and and we were given the freedom to kind of think of our own ideas in our own roles and develop whatever say, and then take the head coach and say, hey, these things, what do you reckon? And if they go, yep, we'll do it. If they say, no, we don't do it, that was fine. We moved on. That changed, unfortunately, after the Asia Cup. Um, and there was a bit of a limit placed on how much we could think on ourselves versus, no, go do this. This is what you need to do. Um, I just want to see just this. You know, from, from, from a role that I was in, they was being told, I want to see this. Can you put this together? I want to kind of get your take, Proud, on a on a specific topic here. That so sure. you have your data, right? And and yep. how do you? So you know when you're when you're in cricket Australia, right? You you mentioned this earlier. Australian cricketers play differently, right? So you're you know yep. a lot of a lot of data driven questions rely around you know boundary rate, dot ball percentage. Mm -hmm. When it comes to, you know, and we, we think of the the West Indian philosophy of, okay, dot ball or six, right? Obviously, that's we've advanced since then. But when you're dealing with Sri Lankan cricketers where hitting sixes is not something necessarily that they've yeah. been taught to do, right? Yeah. And isn't natural yeah. to their game. But it's a big part of, like, how to maximize uh, returns in, in T20 cricket. How do, you, how do you deal with those kind of specific player needs? Right. Um, because yeah. you're like, oh, if you just hit that ball for six, you can take two dot balls. You can't really tell that to someone who struggles to hit sixes. So how do you balance sort of the natural skills that some of the Sri Lankan players have versus some of the places that they might not be as talented as compared to, say, English or Australian cricketers? Yeah, and, and you're spot on. So this is something I kind of spoke about in my thread about uh, where I was talking about the next World Cup. Yeah. Um, it's about the roles, right? And then once you identify the roles, it's about finding – what are we talented in? What are the skills that we have to achieve that, right? Because there's, there's, you know, different ways to get to 160 or 180 or whatever it is we're getting to, you know. Um, and like you said, it we don't have the likes of a Joss Butler or of Glenn Maxwell or, a, you know, so these guys that can just come in and turn the game in, in a matter of few balls, right? So it, for us, it's about then, I believe, this is completely my, my, my belief, where if we know, okay, what are we trying to what's the what's the goal we're trying to get to and we work that out by figuring out what's your par winning score in these in the pitch that we're going to play and you figure out okay it's 170 180 right we work backwards and how do we construct a batting um order or a batting team to to, to get there right and so yeah you need boundaries but it doesn't have to come with raw power all the time it'd be ideal and i think we've got the likes of um, Wani and Dustin um, and Banu, and you can clear the field um, as well when needed. Um, and you've got a couple of the guys there that can, uh, Kusal Pereira, Kusal Mendes, uh, that can clear the field when needed. Um, but it's a matter of having, structuring the batting order in, or structuring the batters in a way that we can still get to 180 and then complement them with the guys that have this, have their strengths that can that can accelerate in a certain way. So you're not having the likes of a Maxwell in your team that can turn turn the tide for you, but you build the team and you know you get, go someone like a you get, get someone like a so for example you go a, you go 180 right and you go okay in your first six overs the first power play you're pushing for 40 to 50 runs right in that 40 yeah. 50 runs you know you're gonna need to go at about eight 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 nines close eight nines and over right eight nines and over I would say is par these days. And eight nines and over, if you think about it and break it down further, it's just technically close to one boundary and over. Right. Right. At most two, but you really only need the one boundary and you can do the rest of singles. Right. So then you go to the power plane, you know you need that one to two boundaries and over. That's a conversation then you work out and go, okay, we're going to go to Pratham and Kosala. You know our batting order is fragile a little bit. 
So you tell the likes of Patham, your job yeah. is back through to 1214. You tell Kusar, your job is to find that one boundary and over. Now, if, if, if Patham gets that boundary and over, that's fine. What would be great is let's maximize that. So you go for a boundary as well. And you turn that, you now suddenly you get an over that's, that's you're going for eight, you can get a 10 or a 12. Right. So it's just about being smart with the players that we have and then identifying. Yeah. And then, you know, every, every game, each, say every bowling team, you're going to have one ball that has a bad day. That you'll feel it. The batters will feel it. Once that first bat over comes, you know, okay, this guy's not in line length yet. The next time he comes on, you just take him on and you know you're going to have an aggressor in the end there and their job is to take that guy down. So it's yeah. about identifying the roles and then plugging them in, plugging each role in a particular um, role that works that can get us to that 170 or the 180, you know. But Brad, go, yeah. going back to the kind of shrunk player's skill set compared yeah. to the Aussie and English players, do you yeah. think with the rise of franchise cricket and kids in Sri Lanka watching French, Josh Butler's and your Glenn Maxwell's, that we'll get a generation through that are all power hitters? Or do you think the system and the way kids are taught how to play cricket in Sri Lanka is so orthodox and so rigid in the, in, to a degree that they're always going to kind of produce players who can play lovely shots but going to chew up the balls? Right. Yeah, look, I think... I think as much as the kids watch the likes of Butler's and Maxwell's and even Hasarangas and Dustin Sharnikas and stuff, as much as they do, it's once they get into the school system where it kind of falls apart. Um, so if you look at Sri Lankan school cricket, right, we're playing, I think, 30 over cricket at the, the shortest. Like yeah. We're talking under 13s and 15s. And then you're paying 40, 50 over cricket in two-day games. There's no T20, there's no T20 tournament there. So these guys at their formative years, when they're coming through, are not being taught how to play T20 cricket. So how are we expecting them once they step into first class or Premier League or what uh, LPL, when I say Premier League, sorry, LPL or, or international cricket or even under-19 cricket, how are we expecting them to suddenly have a game like Maxwell does or a game like Butler does, right? Um, they, they need to be learning how to play the paddles and the scoops early, right? It's, they're going to learn how to play the game. And I think that's one thing that needs to change. School cricket needs to introduce a T20 tournament. Um, so in, in, in Australia, I've got a nephew who plays cricket. He's, I think, 11 now, right? Um, his cricket is max 20 overs at the moment, right? But then throughout, he has 20... Like, they, they play their normal one-day games, but then they have, a, they have a few T20 games during the season as well, yeah. whether it's a club or school, right? Um, so so he, so when, when he... And he's, he's a great example, right? So I give you... He watches them like some Maxwell and Barnukas and all these guys on TV, and he goes, oh, I want to do this. I wanted to do what Usman Kawaja did the other day, and they get excited. But then when they go to school cricket in Sri Lanka, they don't get the chance to try it. Whereas here, he goes, oh, I've got a T20 this week. Um, yeah. You know, and his dad's always complaining to me, oh, this guy, man, he's trying to play reverse sweeps already. And I... <laughs> 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 that's to too. But, but you yeah, know, that's what you brought up the sweeps. Um, the the thing that I, I've noticed about even Sri Lankan senior batters are scared to sweep, right? And yeah. that's yeah. because they're told, and I've heard this from my father. I've heard this from so many fans. Why are you playing the sweep? You'll get out playing the sweep, right? When <laughs> it's an efficient modern day cricket shot, right? And it's not yep. one that's particularly hard to play. They just have to practice it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I wonder too, if it's, as you said, some of the subcontinental things, they're like, Virat Kohli doesn't play the sweep shot, which is a very strange thing. As great yeah. as, a player as he is, you know, doesn't yeah. play the sweep shot. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think, like you said, you, so you got it right there. You said it's down to the culture. Um, you know, um, they, it, subcontinental players traditionally are wrist, right? So they like to use their feet and just work it off rather than um, get down and try and get on top of the ball. Um, so whereas the, the Aussies and the English are big on, you know, sweeping because they like to get on top of the ball and stuff like that. So, um, and, it, and, and it's interesting because now in Sri Lanka, we think about sweeping. As, I think is a massive value. And I actually told my nephew, I said, practice your sweep. You're going growing up in Australia, practice your sweep. That's the one thing I go, if you can sweep, you you and you don't even have to need great great have a great season, you'll probably still get picked because you can sweep and the others can't, right? Yeah. Um, so so um, so I think I, I'm a big believer in sweep, especially with a T twenty game. Um, and I think it's it's quite a important skill to have. Um Pratt, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. What what do you think the the kind of future for the Sri Lanka white ball exploits are i mean 
Does it look bright? There's a lot of hopes pinned on Hasaranga at the moment, isn't there? Mm, there, there is. Um, <laughs> look, I think it is definitely from what, from what I've seen. Look, it is bright. I think we've got a we've 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 got a pool of players, and I've seen it firsthand that are as skillful and as talented as any other team in the world. I've been with them. We've beaten Australia, right? We've beaten the world champions, right? Um, and, and I'm not talking about an Australia from years ago. I'm talking these, the likes of Cummins, Hazelwood, Stark were playing the one-day series when we beat them 3-2, right? So um, we've got a bunch of players here that can that can actually do something special. Um, the trick is us as a as a cricket board, Sri Lanka cricket, basically, will they stick to their, their philosophy? And like you said, stay away from a crisis long enough that these guys can flourish. Um, you look at the likes, I, I was talking to my dad the other day, right? And we're talking about Lyra Kumara, right? He's injured, yes. But I was saying, you know, I tell my dad, I go, do you know how old Lyra is? And he goes, I go, he's 26. Yeah. He feels like he's been around for years, right? But he's only 26, this guy. He's coming through the and he's coming through the ranks. He's only hitting his peak now, right? Um, yeah, the likes of Dushi, probably by the time 2027 comes around, he's probably towards the end. But you look at the likes of the next lot of fastballers, Dilshan Madhashankar, Lyra Kumara, Matisha Patanara, they're all still going to be in their 20s or max 30. Um, so, so we've got this massive talent pool of guys that have got so much experience and will have experience for the next four years. The key is we can't break what we're doing. We've got to stick to our philosophies. And I'm not just talking about selection, because um, I'm the selectors doing a great job. The, 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 the team that was selected for the Zimbabwe series, I was so happy to see it because you can tell that they've, they've selected a squad with 2027 in mind um, mm -hmm. and they're trying to build on it. So let's hope that they can continue to build on it. Um, the T20 squad, I can see as well, they're, they're looking for the current World Cup. And what's going to be interesting is after the 2024 World Cup, the first T20 squad that's selected, that's what I want to see. Because that will tell us. Whoa, what whoa, whoa. Hold on. Is that really dope that we're going to win it? No, I'm not saying <laughs> whether we win it or not. Whether we win it or not. I'm saying yeah. whether we win it or not. It's the first squad. I, I don't know what I see. first series will be after the 2024 yeah. World Cup. But whatever that first series is, what squad we select for that series, that's going to be, because that will tell us a lot about whether the selectors are, have got a philosophy for the next two years. Because the 2026 T20 World Cup is in Sri Lanka. Yep. So that's a huge opportunity for us to to we've got a bunch of guys that come 2026 are going to be mid uh, mid to late 20s or early 30s in their peak playing a T20 World Cup at home. We can't get it anymore. We can't time it any more perfectly. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that's that's key. So I think we're heading in the right direction. Um, even the likes of you know having the guys of Angie and stuff back, people question it. Um, don't get me wrong. I think, you know, you look at that first T20 that he played and people say, oh, he had a high double rate. I, I think he played the perfect innings. He played the innings that we needed to get us the win at that time, on that particular game, the first game, right? Um, so it's, it's a matter of then how, so you can see that experience did pay off. So I think having him in the squad is also a good idea just till 2024. And then we see where we go from that. We've got two years after that of, of then selecting a squad from then and, and rolling from that. So um, it'll be interesting to see. But like I sorry, going back to what I was saying, it's more than selection. It's going to come down to coaching philosophy. What, what, you know, what direction are we going to take? Are we going to take a conservative coaching philosophy? We, we don't know when this Chris's contract expires and then what happens after, right? So, are we going to have another coach that goes forward with an aggressive T Twenty game, or does it, are we going to have a coach that goes a conservative T Twenty game? It's going to come down to the captain. It's going to come down to the support staff. There's a lot of things that need to come into play between now and 2026. That if I was Sri Lanka cricket, I'd be lining them up now yeah. uh, and have a plan now. So that come the end of the 2024 World Cup, pull the trigger, get all these guys signed up, whether they're coaches or selectors or whatever, and lock them in for two years. Oh, you got me excited about it already. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. Then, well, we, we should make a trip to Sri Lanka, maybe do a tour to Sri Lanka for the, the World Cup. All oh, of us. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there. Don't worry about that. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, Prad, I think yeah. we, we've taken enough of your time up. We're definitely going to have to get you in again just to. Yes. Just the, like, I no think problem. what we'll do is we'll go through every single player and coach you worked with, and you can tell us what they were like. <laughs> like and give well, us your best anecdotes of being on tour with them yeah. and stuff. Right? <laughs> um, that, that's what we're going to have to get you on for. Forget the analytical side of it. I just want to know what the guys are like when they're yeah. uh, when they're chilling in, back in the hotels. Uh, Prad, thanks for coming on the Murray. Ed. It's been absolutely fantastic having you on. We definitely. Uh, 
as I said, we'll definitely get you back on again. If you've got all the way through to this point, please hit the subscribe button. Please sign up to the newsletter. The links are in the description below. Um, and we'll be back very soon with more uh, chat and conversation about the shrunken cricket team. Thanks for listening.